Interview, roll 55, scene one, take one. Oh, at one time. <laughs> Are you good? Uh, at okay. one time, you had a by you the production. Yeah. And I don't know anything about that. It might have just been a name, or I don't know where it was based, but uh, there was a Cayuga film in Ithaca in around 1915. If you were to start all over again, while my chair is falling apart, if you were to start all over again, would you go to Hollywood? Would you become part of that, or would you remain independent? Would you, you know... Uh, I'd go to Hollywood and try to be independent in Hollywood. Can you do that? Uh, you can try. Uh, you can also try to be president, too, if you'd like. My guess is that it would be physically impossible to seriously shoot feature films outside of the West Coast today. Rod Serling was born Christmas Day, 1924, in Syracuse, New York, and moved to nearby Binghamton with his family when he was two. He lived there, growing up a talented and popular young man, until his graduation from Central High School when he joined the Army paratroopers to fight overseas in 1942. The situation I was traumatized into writing by war events by going through a war in a combat situation and feeling the desperate sense of the terrible need for some sort of therapy. Get it out of my gut, write it down. This is the way it began for me. But I don't have the problem that George had, that George poses as the problem of, of translation and communication, because I came back with 11 million other guys who had very similar problems. So it was not unique, nor was it not to be expected that of this class of 46, we, were, we had very special problems that we were going to write about. After his return to the States following World War II, Rod enrolled at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. His studies began in physical education, but quickly shifted to languages and literature. It was at Antioch where Rod met Carolyn Kramer, his wife, and it was there he decided to pursue a career in broadcasting. In 1949, the age of radio was quickly giving way to the age of television, and Rod Sterling was well prepared for the writing demands of the new medium. In 1955, after years of radio and TV staff work and freelance script writing, Rod got his decisive break. Patterns, a drama about corporate competitiveness, written for the Kraft Television Theater, was broadcast in January 1955, and was hailed as exciting original writing for television. New York Times critic Jack Gould wrote, Patterns will stand as one of the high points in the TV medium's evolution. For sheer power of narrative, forcefulness of characterization, and brilliant climax, Mr. Sterling's work is a creative triumph that can stand on its own. Patterns was the first live TV drama ever to be repeated nationally by popular demand. And it won Rod his first Emmy for writing. All writers are born and never made. The talent to recreate in language, the experience of life, is, has to be God-given. On the other hand, uh, we can sharpen the wit of a writer. We can point out style to him. Uh, we can uh, use the criteria that is age-old, 3,000 years of theater, uh, that he can utilize to make a judgment on the value of his own work. Uh, we can show him what can move people, what can move human beings. He can go to see a play of Dyer Van Frank, and that's lesson one in the long facet of the human emotion. In 1956 came Rod Serling's Requiem for a Heavyweight, the first original 90-minute drama to be broadcast on Playhouse 90. With its cast of Jack Palance as the aging boxer Mountain McClintock, Ed Wynn as his trainer, and Keenan Wynn as Mountain's unscrupulous manager, TV had seen no finer drama. I was almost the heavyweight champion of the world. Well, and you just remember that. Remember you was almost heavyweight champion of the world. And I remember I was the guy who managed you. Oh, look, kid, we'll do this one with our eyes closed. Take him home, will you, Army? No, never mind, Army. No, I, I can go home by myself. Ah, well, he, he's just upset. 
He just don't know. He knows. Believe me, he knows. Ah, yeah, he'll come around. Sure he will. You'll fix it that way. You've got a knack, Nash. You violin him to death. If that doesn't work, squeeze him a little. Back him up a little. Twist his arm a little for him. What a knack you've got, Nash. Hey, Army. Stick, will you? Stick? You know, help me with him. Just stay alongside. Oh, partners again, huh? If he sees me, he'll move fast. Is that the idea? No, no, no. I just want to see the both of us there. Don't let him alone. This is a lousy one night. Say, stand. it ain't bad enough that I have to watch this kid go down all these years. Now you want me in the pit so I can officiate at the burial. It don't have to be that way, Army. This kid is a slob to you, Mace. He's a hunk of flesh. He's a has-been. A dead weight. Is that what you call a cross to bear? Listen to me. I'll tell you what he is, Mace, this boy. He's a decent man. He's a man with a heart. He's somebody with flesh and blood. You can't sell this on the market by the pound. Because if you do, Mace, if you do, you'll rot in the gutter for it. Understand me? You'll rot. Army, be there at least, will you? You know, don't, don't leave him alone. No, I won't. I can't leave him alone. He'll do it for you even if I'm not there. So I'll be there. Why is it, Mage? Tell me, why is it so many people have to feed off of one guy's misery? Doesn't it... Tell me, Mage, doesn't it make you want to die. In 1957, Requiem swept the Emmy Awards with critical acclaim for its script, direction, and performance. In that year, Rod also won the Sylvania Award for Writing Achievement and a Peabody Award, the first ever to be given to a writer. Rod was recognized by 1959 as one of a handful of gifted young playwrights who were shaping the future of television drama. But 1959 was not an easy time for television. Problems of censorship and commercialism were threatening creativity. Unlike many others, Rod used his hard-earned respect to speak out about dilemmas facing the writers of his day. Well, we hear a lot about censorship of the writer on TV. We write a good deal about it in your own case, especially. Well, depending, of course, on the thematic treatment you're using, if you have the temerity to try to dramatize a theme that involves any particular social controversy currently extant, then you're in deep trouble. For instance? Uh, a racial theme, for example. My, the case in point, I think, uh, a show I did for the Steel Hour some years ago, three years ago, called Noon on Doomsday, yeah. which was uh, a story which purported to tell what was the aftermath of the alleged kidnapping in Mississippi of the Till Boy, yeah. the young Chicago Negro. And I wrote the script using black and white uh, initially. Then it was changed uh, to suggest an unnamed foreigner. Then the locale was moved from the south to, the, to New England. And I'm convinced they'd have gone up to Alaska or the North Pole if and using Eskimos as a possible minority, except I suppose the costume problem was of sufficient severity not to attempt it. But it became a lukewarm, vitiated, emasculated kind of show. You went along with it? All the way. I protested. I went down fighting, as most television writers do, yeah. thinking in a strange, oblique, philosophical way that better say something than nothing. In this particular show, though, by the time they had finished taking Coca-Cola bottles off the set because these monster claimed that this had southern connotations, suggesting to what depth they went to make this a clean, antiseptically, rigidly uh, acceptable show. Uh, why, it bore no relationship at all to what we had purported to say in initially. Patty Chayefsky has talked about the insidious influence of what he calls pre-censorship. How does that work? Uh, Pre-censorship is a practice, I think, of most television writers. I can't speak for all of them. This is the prior knowledge of the writer of those areas which are difficult to try to get through. And so a writer will shy away from writing those things which he knows he's going to have trouble with on the sponsorial or an agency level. 
We practice it all the time. We just do not write those themes, which, you know are going, which we know are going to get into trouble. Who's the culprit? Is it the network? The sponsor? It sure is not the FCC. No, it's certainly not the FCC, ideally speaking, of course. It's a combination of culprits in this case, Mike. It's partly network. It's principally agency and sponsor. In many ways, I think it's the audience themselves. How do you mean? Well, I'll give you an example. About a year ago, roughly 11 or 12 months ago, on the Lassie show, this is a story usually told by Sheldon Leonard, who was then associated with the show. Lassie was having puppies. And I have two little girls, then age five and three, who are greatly enamored of this beautiful collie. Mm -hmm. And they watched the show with great interest. And Lassie gave birth to puppies. And Mike, it was probably one of the most tasteful and delightful and warm things uh, depicting what is this, this, this wondrous thing that is birth. And after the show, I, I think there were many congratulations all around because it was a lovely show. The sort of thing I'd love my kids to watch to show them what is the birth process and how marvelous it is. They got many, many cards and letters. Sample card from the Deep South, this was. If I wanted my kids to watch sex shows, I wouldn't have had them turn on that. I could take them to burlesque shows. And as a result of the influx of mail, many of the cards, incidentally, as Sheldon tells it, were postmarked at identical moments, all in the same handwriting, but each was counted as a singular piece of mail. And as a result, the directive went down that there would be no shows having anything to do with puppies, that is, in the actual birth process. Well, obviously, it is this wild lunatic fringe of letter writers that, that greatly affect what the sponsor has in mind. You can understand the position of the sponsor, can't I, you? In, in many ways, I suppose I can. He's there to push a product. You've got a new series coming up called The Twilight Zone. You are writing as well as acting ex executive producer on this one. Who controls the final product, you or the sponsor? We have what I think, at least uh, theoretically anyway, because it hasn't really been put into practice yet, a good working relationship. We're in questions of taste, in questions of the art form itself, in questions of drama. I'm the judge, because this is my medium and I understand it. I'm a dramatist for television. This is the area I know. I've been trained for it, I've worked for it for 12, in it for 12 years, and the sponsor knows his product, but he doesn't know mine. So when it comes to the commercials, I leave that up to him. When it comes to the story content, he leaves it up to me. Has nothing been changed in the... We changed in 18 scripts, Mike. We have had one line changed. Is pre-censorship, though, involved? Are you simply writing easy? In this particular area, no, because we're dealing with a half-hour show, which cannot probe like a 90, which doesn't use scripts as vehicles of social criticism. These are strictly for entertainment. These are pot boilers. Oh, no, uh-uh. I then wouldn't call them pot boilers at all. No, these are very adult, uh, I think, high-quality, half-hour, extremely polished films. But because they deal in the areas of fantasy and imagination and science fiction and all, all of those things, uh, there's no opportunity to cop a plea or, or chop an axe or anything. Well, you're not going to be able to cop a plea or chop an axe because you're going to be, obviously, working so hard on the Twilight Zone that, in essence, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, you've given up on writing anything important for television, right? Yeah. For the, well, uh, again, this is a semantic thing, important for television. I don't know. If by important you mean I'm not going to try to delve into current social problems dramatically, you're quite right. I'm not. There is a fifth dimension, beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the twilight zone. How about some service? Quiet. I'm sorry. Fill it up, will you? Sure. 
Martin Sloan, age 36. Occupation, vice president, ad agency, in charge of media. This is not just a Sunday drive from Martin Sloan. He perhaps doesn't know it at the time, but it's an exodus. Somewhere up the road, he's looking for sanity. And somewhere up the road, he'll find something else. And now back to our story with Rob Serling. Rob, let me repeat it. Herbert Brodkin, a TV producer, associated with some of your earlier players, has said this about you. He said, Rob is either going to stay commercial or become a discerning artist, but not both. Now, I, I has it ever occurred to you that you're selling yourself short by taking on a series which, by your own admission, is going to be a series primarily designed to entertain? I remember the quote. Uh, he got... Uh, he, got it, he gave it to Gilbert Milstein when Milstein was doing a profile on me in the New York Times. I didn't understand it at the time. I, I failed to achieve any degree of understanding in the ensuing years, which are three in number. If I, I presume uh, Herb means that inherently you cannot be commercial and artistic. You cannot be commercial and quality. You cannot be commercial concurrent with having a, a preoccupation with the level of storytelling that you want to achieve. And this I have to reject. I think you can be, I don't think calling something commercial tags it with a kind of an odious suggestion that it stinks, that it's something raunchy to be ashamed of. I don't think uh, if you say commercial means to be publicly acceptable, what's wrong with that? As long, the, the, the essence of my argument, Mike, is that as long as you are not ashamed of anything you write, be, if you're a writer, as long as you're not ashamed of anything you perform if you're an actor, and I'm not ashamed of doing a television series, I could have, right, I could have done probably 30 or 40 film series over the past five years. I, I presume at least I've turned down that many mm -hmm. with, uh, with great guarantees of cash, with great guarantees of, of financial security, but I've turned them down because I didn't like them. I did not think they were quality, and God knows they were commercial. Uh, but I think uh, innate in what Herb says is this suggestion made by many people that you can't have public acceptance and still be artistic. And I, as I say, I have to reject that. In his quintessential series, The Twilight Zone, Rod created a unique genre for television drama, making quick end run around the censors and opening up a vast new world for fantasy and imagination on TV. Rod's own imagination was unleashed full force as a writer, producer, and narrator of the series. In walking distance from the first Twilight Zone season, Rod gets an opportunity to explore one of his favorite topics, home. Gig Young is a busy ad executive from New York Bobby, who, on a country here. drive, Bobby. unwittingly Bobby, stumbles upon his past. Bobby? Bobby, mind me. Bobby, will you come down to that tree? Come on, Bobby. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby listen to me. Come on. Bobby. Come on. Get down. Bobby. Come on. Bobby. That's the boy. Come on, right Bobby, here. Bobby, what am I ever going right. to do with you? Oh, it's a wonderful, isn't it? Part? Yeah. Certainly is. All right, Bobby. That's part of summer, too. The music from the merry-go-round, the calliope. And the cotton candy. The ice cream. The band concert. Nothing quite as good ever. Nothing quite as good as summer, being a kid. Are you from around here? No. No, what I mean is I used to be a long time ago. Lived a couple blocks away. I played baseball in that field over there. That merry-go-round. Oh, my goodness. I grew up with that merry-go-round. I carved my name on that post in the bandstand one summer. I was 11 years old. I carved my...
thought you'd like to know the boy will be all right. The doctor says he'll limp some, but he'll be all right. Oh, I thank God for that. You dropped this at the house. I looked inside it. It tells a great many things about you. Your driver's license, the cards, the money in it. It seems you are Martin Sloan. You're 36 years old and you have an apartment in New York City. It says your driver's license expires in 1960. That's 25 years from now. And the dates on the bills, those dates haven't happened yet either. And you... you know, Pop? Yes, I know. I know who you are. I know you've come from a long way from here. A long way and a long time. But I don't understand how or why. Do you? But you do know other things, don't you, Martin? Things that will happen. Yes, I do. Martin. Yes, Pop. You have to leave here. There's no room. There's no place. Do you understand that? I see that now, but I don't understand. Why not? I guess because we only get one chance. Maybe there's only one summer to every customer. That little boy, the one I know, the one who belongs here, this is his summer, just as it was yours once. Don't make him share it. All right, Martin. Is it so bad where you're from? I thought so, Pop. I've been living in a dead run and I was tired. And one day I knew I had to come back here. I had to come back and get on a merry-go-round and eat cotton candy and listen to a band concert. I had to stop and breathe and close my eyes and smell and listen. I guess we all want that. Maybe when you go back, Martin, you'll find that there are merry-go-rounds and band concerts where you are. Maybe you haven't been looking in the right place. You've been looking behind you, Martin. Try looking ahead. Maybe. Goodbye, son. Goodbye, Pop. had a taste for common problems of humanity that are good at any time. They, he, he dealt with ordinary people who had uh, uh, problems or desires or wishes or loves or passions uh, that were universally understood. And so a story about a man who was desperate for a second chance to do something is just as good in 1984 as it was in 59. Uh, and since he wrote with so much uh, compassion for the human condition, uh, it just still works. Very often I find that within the framework of the science fiction or fantasy genre, the use of traveling back in time is a very effective way of producing contrasts, uh, of producing a kind of a freewheeling storytelling device which is why I used going back in time. And there's another reason, <clears throat> which very much relates to any discussion of creativity, is that every writer, and I don't think there are any, I can't conceive of anybody not falling into this pattern who writes, has certain special loves, certain special hang-ups, certain special preoccupations and predilections. In my case, it's a hunger to be young again a desperate hunger to go back where it all began. And I think you'll see this as a running thread through a lot of things that I write. And part of creativity, of course, is being able to have the capacity to convey that kind of hunger, that kind of nostalgia, that kind of bittersweet feeling to those who have never had it. For five seasons, 
Twilight Zone served as a showcase for talented young writers, actors, and directors, as well as a testament to Rod's prolific writing abilities. Of 156 scripts, Rod wrote 92. With Twilight Zone, Rod Sterling won two more Emmys and took his place as a major creative force in the growth of television in the 1960s. Rod was an outspoken president of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. He also wrote numerous motion picture scripts, among them Assault on a Queen, Seven Days in May, and Planet of the Apes. He wrote and compiled books of his plays, narrated TV and radio programs, and in the early 1970s, wrote and hosted television's Night Gallery. He was very tough on himself, and he was tough on others in a nice way. Uh, because he called, he called shots as he saw them. He said, I don't understand why, I don't understand why the makeup looked that way. That doesn't, that doesn't help the story at all. Not cross, but letting all hands know that if a little more care had been taken, it could have been better. And he was equally tough on himself. Until his passing at 50 years of age in 1975, a good portion of Rod's last years were spent as a teacher and lecturer at Ithaca College, not far from his family's summer home in upstate New York. The college now curates the Serling archive of tapes, scripts, films, and related collections. A man far ahead of his time, a gifted man driven to express his deepest joys and fears, a man universally loved, Rod Serling will be remembered best by many as a warm and sincere friend with a great sense of humility and an unfailing wit. Uh, it's been my concern on a college level that we don't shoot enough footage, that we take too much out of a textbook, that we listen much too much to lectures, that we hear how, but we never are shown what. And to me, that text, from a text point of view, uh, from an educative point of view, I think is the only way to learn how to shoot movies. And the other thing being this level of be brave about it. If it's never been done, try it. If it looks like an inordinate shot, shoot it. Uh, if you've never seen it before, by all means, try it. The horizons of this thing are limitless, the way to make movies. And within, within the realm of every single individual who's shooting the picture is a strange capacity to do something different, which they should do. And I haven't got another goddamn thing to say to you, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go. Unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound. And a dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone.